Amen. Thank you, praise team, for leading us this morning. I want you to continue to go with me to Jonah, chapter 3. If you're ages 2 through 5, you can follow Miss Logan down to Children's Church. Ages 2 through 5 can make their way down. You take your copy of God's Word and go with me to Jonah, the third chapter. Jonah, chapter number 3. Jonah, chapter number 3. And the Bible says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published it through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed or drink water, but let man be let, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of his disaster that he had, that he had said he would do to them and he did not do it. Father, now as we look at your word this morning, we pray that you will open our mind and our heart to truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Look what verse 2 and 3 say. Verse 2 and 3 say, let us go to Nineveh, that great city, call out against it in the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Three days journey in breath. Nineveh, one of the greatest cities of the world of that day. One of the most evil cities of the world of that day. Jonah tells us that there is a three day walk through that city. That it takes three days to just to get through the city. And God calls Jonah to go there and to preach to these people. And not only does he do that, nobody would think of in that time and in that day, nobody in their right mind would think of besieging the city of Nineveh. It was a huge city. I mean, look, look, you couldn't literally, you couldn't get an army around it. You couldn't get the army around it to besiege it. But yet, there is where God sends Jonah. And it's neat to see that the foolish of God, many times the foolishness of God is wiser than the plans of man. God decides to come in to the great city of Nineveh and he comes in there to occupy it. Now listen, he comes in to occupy it with the army of one. Not a huge, big army, not a big task going in, just the army of one. God took one person And he brought him into a city and he changed the city. He became a city changer. Not only a city changer, Jonah became a world changer. That's what he became. You say, oh, that's fine and dandy, but what's that got to do? Well, I I, I think one of the things that we all need to understand, we all need to grasp, we all need to get a hold of is... Sin. And the sin of the age, the sin of the age that you and I live in, is nothing bigger than my own interest. That is the big sin. What is in it for me? 
my own interest. We don't live anymore for something worth dying for. Now I realize all of us have a conscience here this morning. All of us do. All of us have a conscience of some kind. And you know how come I know that? It's because we all give. We'll give to charities. We'll volunteer our time to help in certain organizations and do things. But the question is, the real question is, is there anything gripping my life? Is there a cause that is shaping my life, that is gripping my life? Is there anything that I would be willing to die for? I want to tell you, if there's not, listen to me, dear church family. If there's not, your heart is going to become cold. And your soul is going to begin to shrivel up. Because you made your life all about you. Listen, listen to me this morning. There's people around that need you. There really are. There are people that you see every day that need you. They're dying, both physically and spiritually. They are dead. They are helpless. They are hurting. They are longing for somebody to share the gospel with them, to give them just a touch of their hand, to walk with them in their pain and their sorrow. Is there something bigger than you? That's the question. How then do you become an army of one? How do you become a Jonah? How does all of that happen? How does that take place? Well, notice with me first of all, notice with me first of all, there is always when it comes for the church to being the army of one, for an individual to be an army of one, what do we got to do? We need to see first of all that there is persistent grace. Thank God for grace. Look at verse 1. He says, then the word, look at this, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Now, you, you've been with us. You know what's going on with Jonah. You know God has said, go to Nineveh. God said, Jonah says, no, I believe I'm going to check out and go the other way. And he goes down to Joppa. And he runs from the Lord. And God brings a storm up. And God puts a, puts a fish in the storm. And, 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 he, and he repents. And he says, look, I'm going to give my life for you guys. Let me throw me overboard. They throw him overboard. There's a, there's a fish there. eats him. And he's praying in the fish. We've seen all of that. We've seen how re- reckless Jonah has been. We have seen how rebellious Jonah has been. But yet in Jonah chapter 3, the writer tells us that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Now, I, I don't know about you, but this is one mixed up story. I mean, this is mixed up. This is crazy. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah? Let me ask you, we're fighting Al-Qaeda, we're fighting ISIS, we're fighting all of these enemies of ours. Would you take a general who has been court-martialed for crimes against the state and put him in charge of the greatest battle we're going to fight against them? No. No. You wouldn't do that. And you certainly wouldn't give it to Jonah to go into Nineveh and preach. But that's exactly what God does. God comes to Jonah. You think of it. You think the apostles minus Judas. Think of the apostles at the death of Christ. Who was the number one foul up in the death of Christ outside of Judas? Peter. And who does Jesus leave in charge when he leaves? Peter. Wow. That's the Jonah principle. What is the Jonah principle? Life out of death. Failures. Failures, heartache, suffering that makes you useful. That's what it is. Jesus talks about it to the Pharisees, doesn't he? 
Pharisees come to Jesus and say, look, if you're the Messiah, if you're who you say you are, if you're a God, then do a miracle for us. Let me see this miracle. And Jesus certainly could have done that. Amen? He could have done a miracle of some kind. But this is what he says in Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 11. He says, the original sign you receive is, is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the deep for three days, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days. What does it mean? What does it mean that he doesn't give them a miracle, but he says that the sign that you'll have is the sign of Jonah. No, what, what Christ is saying to them, look, you will know me not by my power, but by my weakness. You will know me by humbling myself. Because you see, the Bible says, the, the Bible says that, that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient as a servant. That he died on the cross of Calvary. And what Jesus was saying to these scribes and Pharisees, it's out of death that man receives life. John 12, 24, Jesus says, Unless a kernel of wheat fall to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it does, but but when it does, it produces many seeds. That's not only true in the life of Jesus, that's not only true in the life of John, but those who know Christ as their Savior, it is true in our lives also. You see, I want you to know something. It is failure, it is suffering, it is heartache, it is, it is those dark times in your life where you're there because of your own sin or you're there in just the providence of God, however it may be. It is during those times that God makes you a servant. There's where you are. And of course the big question always is, but I hear what you're saying, but why? Why in the world do we have to suffer? Why is it heartache? Why is it difficulty? Why are these things going on? Can I tell you why? I think you know why. But let me tell you why. Because we're all sinful. Every one of us in this building this morning, we are sinful, sinful people. And we're not only sinful people, we are very self-centered people. We enjoy the things that help us to have enjoyment, right? We don't necessarily like taking a cross up. We have to fight. If you're a believer here this morning, we all have to fight for truth. We have to make it a daily thing in our lives to fight for truth because we're self-centered. We're sinful. And so God comes along and he shakes us up. God comes along and he shakes that out of us. And so here comes suffering. Here comes trouble. Here comes failure. And what does suffering, trouble, and failure do? It makes you a servant. It not only makes you a servant for the kingdom, it makes you a humble servant for the kingdom. It makes you, as John the Baptist said, when they ask of him the Messiah, he says, oh no, he's coming. His shoe latches. I'm not even worthy to undo. That's the kind of servant it makes you. A humble servant. How many, how many of y'all remember the Charles Dickens story of Scrooge? You know that story of Scrooge? Scrooge is a man that's rather wealthy. Scrooge is a good name for him. But he has these dreams. Scrooge becomes a useful man. After all of these dreams he comes through, he becomes a useful man. How does Scrooge become a useful man? Well, he took six weeks of psychotherapy and he talked it over with his counselor and he realized how, how awful he was and he left after six weeks a changed man. Is that what happened? Is that the story? That's really not the story, is it? Well, I'll tell you what he did. He, he, actually, uh, he actually went and, and, and because he was so wealthy, he, he, he had a little place out in the, 
a countryside by himself and he, he just went there every day and he blocked his mind from all things and he spent many years, many times just meditating on nothing and reflecting on the beauty of the skies and the wonderful of the birds and after about six or seven weeks of this wonderful reflection, this man came back into town and he was a new man. No. No, that's not what happened to him. He had a near-death experience and it humbled him. It not only humbled him, it humiliated him. That's what happened. And that's what failure and suffering, it makes you a servant. A servant. It makes you compassionate again. It makes you have a zeal for the gospel, a zeal to take the cross up and to follow the Lord Jesus. Now I know that some of you have read ahead of the book, and I'm certain you have, and you've read it millions of times. Jonah's not all the way there yet. If you've noticed, every sermon we've talked about, Jonah's had to do what? Repent. He's still got some repenting to do. He's still going to have some repenting to do. But isn't that the life of a, of a real Christian? Isn't that the life of a believer? A life of a believer is a life of repenting. A life of walking with Christ and repenting of sin and enjoying fellowship with Him. And that is what failure and suffering and heartache bring in our lives. Sometimes it brings repentance. It makes us more compassionate. It makes us servants. So what's the application? Suffering failure now listen listen you got to get this because here's what can happen suffering failure heartache raw disappointments in your life can make you hard there may be some of you in here this morning you face some very difficult things in your life As I look over this crowd, I can see those. I know those. I've walked with you through those. And if you're not careful, they will not turn you into an army of one, but they will turn you into a stone-cold person that nobody can figure out. And I want to say to you, take your suffering and your failure and your pain and all of that pin up inside of you and let God use it to draw you out of yourself and into the kingdom work. Suffering, heartache makes you callous. And let me just tell you, every heartache, every difficulty, everything that comes your way, one of two things can happen. It is going to harden you or it is going to soften you. But listen to me this morning. It is not going to leave you unchanged. You will not be unchanged. Some of you have had great zeal for the kingdom, but your zeal is waning. It may be because you've walked through the valley of difficulty. You've walked through the valley of pearl. And you're allowing the valley to consume you and not Christ to consume you in the midst of it. Let me tell you a story about the king, Manasseh. He was one of the kings of Judah. Now I want to tell you, if there's anybody worse than Manasseh, it'd be hard to go. Manasseh's a wicked king. I mean, he is so wicked that the city, literally the city, could run with the blood of his own children. Because you know what he did with his own children? Can you imagine taking your little baby and laying it in the, in the god of Moloch, a, a, a hot, burning god, and just letting your child roast there as a sacrifice to a god? But that's who Manasseh is. But the Bible says he humbled himself and God received him and God restored to him the kingdom. And I want you to understand, listen to me this morning. God uses Jonah's, God uses Peter's, and God uses Manasseh's. And he can use you too. 
What I'm trying to say to you this morning is don't waste your suffering. Don't waste your heartache. Don't waste your discouragement and your pain. Don't waste it on a pity party on yourself. Don't waste it on locking yourself off to everything else that you once did and you just live your life the way you want to live it. No, no, don't waste them. Don't waste them. Let them drive you to Christ. Let them drive you to service and compassion and humility for the glory of God. I like that verse. I like verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God's persistent grace. He continually loves. He continually helps. He comes back to you. And he uses you in your failure and your suffering. Persistent grace. But there's a second thing in our text. There's a calling of God. And look what he says. Look what he says in verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Let me just tell you what God is. God is a sending God. Just understand that. That's what the theme of, you can see it throughout all the Bible. God is a sending God. Now let me just tell you. God doesn't come to Jonah and say, hey, Jonah, old boy, let me tell you something. You've had a hard few days. I mean, I'm certain it wasn't joyful laying around in the fluid of a whale. I, I'm certain it wasn't. John, tell you what I need you to do. <clears throat> There's a cruise ship going to the Bahamas. I want you to get on it and take it off, take a few weeks off, come back, and we'll talk about this. That's not what he does, is it? No, the Bible says the word of the Lord came again to to Jonah and he said, do what? He said, go, just go. Just get up and go, Jonah. Go to Nineveh, do what I listen. Listen to me, hear me well this morning, church family. Missions is not for the well-rested. If you're thinking I'm just going to wait till I have some time, and then I, you're never going to have time. Missions is not for the well-rested. It is not for the elite who, who, who you think are highly organized and can do all of these things. It is not for you who think that you have time on your hands. Some of you sit around and say, well, let them do it. They've got plenty of time. No, it is not for those that have money. It is not even for those that have no money. It is not for those who have a theological education. No. Let me tell you who missions is for. It is for anybody who belongs to Christ. Anybody who belongs. Anybody that names the name of Christ. You, sir, ma'am, are a missionary. When he comes to him, he comes to him a second time. And sometimes he comes to us a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time. What's he saying? What's he saying to Community Baptists? What's he saying to you when he comes to you a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time? What does he say to us? He's trying to get us to see. He's trying to get Jonah to see. He's trying to get us to see. Listen, who am I really? Do you see who I really am? Am I want you to finally see who I am? See, you won't live like Christ. He, if you want to live like Christ, you've got to see who He is. And Christ is in the business of changing people. That's what He's in the business of. Genesis chapter 12, Abraham says, God says to Abraham, You get up out of this earth, Chaldees, you leave your family, and I will bless you. I will make you a nation of the stars. You can't even count the number of stars. They'll realize you just go. And God does exactly what he says to Abraham. He blesses him. And listen, God never blesses you except that to make you a blessing to someone else. And how did he do that to Abraham? He said, Abraham, you go. And Abraham did what? He got out. He went. Listen to me this morning. You got to get up and go. Sometimes our get up and go has gone up and went. Right? Right? we got to get up and go. And some of us, quite frankly, this morning, some of us in this building this morning, we're afraid of that. Let's just be honest about it. 
We're like, we're like Jonah. <laughs> Go where? Do what? Huh? No, thank you. I'll cruise this way. I'll go the opposite way. Some of you are afraid. I mean, listen, let's just be honest. Some of us are afraid to get involved with any basket cases. They're nuts. Heaven help. They're going to they're going to drain some of my time. Some of my precious time. They're going to take some of that from me. I may be sitting down to dinner with my family and they call, what will I do? The sky is going to fall. You're afraid of it. You're afraid because it might mean it takes a commitment. I want you to understand ministry and missions will take a piece of your time. It's not going to take a piece of your time. It's going to take a piece of you. Yeah, guess what? It is going to take some of your budget. Maybe sometimes more than you care to like. I want to tell you, we still need people to sign up for Antioch. We still need people that are going to be consistent, faithful. Yeah, but Brother Ron, man, I, I want to sleep in on Saturdays. I work five days a week. Saturday is my only time to sleep in. Listen, you got 10,000 years to rest in the arms of Jesus. Right? You got 10,000 years to rest in the arms of Jesus. We're going to launch out into Awanas. We're going to need workers. Did you hear me? That's that word commitment. We're going to need those people. We're going to need you. Yes, to drag your tired five o'clock work body here to Community Baptist on Wednesday night to serve kids for the glory of God. Not getting a lot of amens, getting kind of quiet out there this morning. Yes, yes. We're going to need you to get in that wallet and give. So that Antioch can be taken. Listen. We gotta have we gotta have money to, we gotta have money to run a bus. You gotta have money to do supplies. But the problem with our culture is we're too comfortable. We're more satisfied with what we want than what the kingdom wants. Hello, am I still here? Anybody here with me this morning? And before anybody would think, oh yeah, that's just to increase the budget to get everybody. No, listen. Let me just tell you where it's at. Your elders, we put our we put our we put our we put our stuff on the line. We're willing not to be paid. We're willing to go the second and third mile and the fifth and tenth and hundredth mile so that the kingdom can advance. And I'm saying to Community Baptist. You better be doing the same thing. That's what you better be doing. What I'm saying to you is it's time to get out of the comfort zone. It's time to step up the plate. Talk with Deacon last night. He's a little discouraged. I just have to be honest with you. He's a little discouraged. We've got a great opportunity at, 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 at Antioch. But we got to have people that's going to step up. And you say, well, I've been down there four or five times and I just stood around and did nothing. You're there. You're needed there. If not, go door to door and grab some of those kids and bring them in on Saturday morning. We're going to look at that. We're going to work on that. 
We've got Haiti. We've got people that need to be raised up to go and teach and give. And you say, you're talking a lot about, well, listen, Rob, you're talking about money and time and, and you're stretching me. And I say, amen. Because it ain't me stretching you. It's God stretching you. And it's for his glory. And what I'm saying to you is, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. Look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he's set down at the right hand of the Father. Look unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher of your faith. Because it's easy to say I'm a Christian. But do you live for him? Or do you live for your schedule and your career and your love and your goals? Can you, can you say, here is where I am moving out. I'm going to give myself physically. I'm going to give myself spiritually, financially, emotionally. I'm going to invest in lives. Some of you say, well, now wait a minute, Brother Ron. I just don't have any gifts. I don't have any talents. I'm not smart enough. Can I tell you something? Listen to me. God doesn't need any of that. He doesn't need your gifts, your talents, whether you got money or don't have. He doesn't need any of that. He just needs your will. He just needs you. See, God gave a strategy. Jonah has a strategy from God. We have a strategy from God. God sent Jonah to the city. God sent Paul to the city. And God has a strategy where we are. God has opened the doors for us to do this. The question is, what are we doing where we're at? Do we love the places God opens up for us or do we hate the places? And until you have the attitude of being a servant, you can't love anything. You can't be an army of one. And listen, there's power there. Look at verse 8 through 10. Look what he says. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what, he, what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them and he did not do it. Wow. The king heard and the king repented. Actually, the Hebrew says it something like this. When the word touched even the king, he turned to his subjects and said, let's turn from our evil ways and our violence. Let me just tell you what, it, what that, let me tell you what, the, that's a ring cry of every politician, every social worker, every counselor wants to hear happen, repent. And how did it happen? How did it happen? First of all, who repented? Jonah repented. I want to say to you this morning, listen to me this morning. Sometimes it's time for us to do some real repenting of our selfishness, of our pride, of our holding it in for ourselves. Sometimes we have to do some real repenting. Jonah repented. And when Jonah repented and started preaching the gospel, and, and, and let me just say, Jonah's sermon is not a very great sermon, but God used it. The city repented. I'm telling you, the answers to the problems in our world today is not more psychotherapy, not more counseling, not more help with, from, from the government to fill more money with people so they can maybe get a step up. No, no, the answer, listen to me this morning, the answer is repentance. Sin can only be dealt with through repentance. That is it. And I want to tell you as we close this morning, if you're not a world changer, if you're, if, if, you're, if, you're doing, if you're doing nothing much more than just being absorbed in your own problems, then look, 
Now I recognize there are seasons for rest. There are seasons for restoration. There are seasons for healing. And you might be going through one of those things right now. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. That's not what I'm here to do this morning. What I'm trying to do is say, aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of the lack of no zeal in your life? Won't you be willing to see if you're not a world changer? And if you're not a world changer, it's number one, because you're wasting your troubles and sorrows. You're not using them the right way. Don't waste your troubles and sorrows. Or number two, you're not taking, you're not taking a good look at who God is. Or number three, you actually are guilty of unbelief. You don't believe in the power of God. You don't believe in repentance. And you need to leave those things. Somebody may say, well, I'm scared. Somebody will say, well, I've got scars. God will use your scars. I'm not articulate. I don't know what to say. It's easy for you to say. You know these things. Look at Jonah. Jonah changed the city. Did you see what he did? He got up and said, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's all he said. Do you call that a very good message? <laughs> it didn't even tell them to, he didn't even tell them to repent. He didn't even tell them to turn. He didn't even tell them there was a possibility of escape. Listen, that was a lousy job. And what did God do? God changed the whole country through him. And I want to tell you something. You can do better than him. Look what it cost Jesus. Christ is to be the ambassador for you. What will it cost you to be an ambassador for him? Well, it won't cost you anything but what you're going to have to give up someday anyway. It's going to have to be given up someday anyway. A thousand years from now, what you, what, you hold ter- what you hold dear a thousand years from now won't matter. Uh, I like this verse. The word of the Lord came a second time. And yes, it comes a third time and a fourth time. And I want to ask you this morning as we close, how many times has it come to you? How many times has it come to you? And do you hear it this morning? Do you hear it? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Let's be for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom an army of one. Father, thank you for the word of God this morning. And the truth of your word. Lord we come and we confess to you this morning. That we oftentimes are scared and perplexed and troubled on every hand. But you have been gracious and good and kind. To come to us a second time, a third time and a fourth time. Help us to be obedient to you. And to share your message for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, let's sing.